Okay, this is a, a PhD training event uh, looking at the writing, reviewing and appraising of research publications. So the focus of it will be on why, what the motivation is for us to publish, what the basic review process is and what the reviewers will generally be looking for, what are some typical things that, that allow papers to be rejected, look at an overall paper structure, try to identify some of the key things around proofreading, proving the readability and presentation of a paper, the general reviewing process and some tips on success. So the presentation itself is based on uh, one uh, running through of the of the training and shows the results that were gathered from that initial instance. Okay, so the first thing that was asked was a very simple position really to look at the number of publications that the students had uh, up to this point. So we can see here that the majority of the, the class had no publications at all, uh, typically within the first year of the, the PhD. Second one was uh, how, when they were looking to publish. And we can see the time window is that mainly students were looking to publish within the next six months. And we asked how important it was to an external examiner that the student had publications within the Viva. And the answer it can be seen is that yes, it's, it's fairly important there that, uh, that the student actually has some publications when they go to a Viva. It's a difficult question to ask, but how many publications do you think is, is right for a PhD thesis. And we can see here the majority are, think that is somewhere between two and, and five is about the right level. Although some uh, think that possibly between five and ten is, is a good amount. So do you actually know what your external examiner will be looking for within inside your thesis and your viva? So it can be seen that the majority would say that they had some idea, but possibly they, they still needed some focus on what to be preparing for, for both the thesis and the viva. And we all know from undergraduate and postgraduate classes that it's well known what the learning outcomes of any modules are, but with inside a PhD it's often difficult to determine really what the the basic learning outcomes actually are. So we asked how many had some idea of the learning come, outcomes, and we see here there is a fair split, uh, good amounts of yes and good amounts of some idea, but there is some here that uh, don't actually know at the current time what the basic learning outcomes are. And it's very difficult to really define what the end outcomes are, but really these give four pointers towards what these should be. And one of the key ones is the creation and interpretation of new knowledge through original research. And a key word, key word here is to satisfy peer review and to extend the forefront of the discipline and merit to publication. So we can see here in this, in this learning outcome the importance of publications and especially of peer-reviewed publications. So if it's possible for a student to get these peer-reviewed publications then they satisfy at least part of this learning outcome and it allows the external examiner possibly to spend a lesser time on reading and verifying the actual content of the thesis as it may have already been through a peer review process. Some of the other ones uh, is to really to be able to cope, manage a project, to be able to cope with unforeseen uh, difficulties, which is a good uh, skill for a researcher to have, uh, to be able to change tact at any time, change focus, uh, but really uh, end up defining the end goals. Systematic acquisition of uh, un, of acquisition and understanding of a substantial body of knowledge at the forefront of the discipline. So you can see here the importance of a literature review and underpinning new research 
with the work of others is so important for this learning outcome. And then a detailed understanding of some of the techniques that are applicable within research and academic inquiry. So this is so important to have a scientific approach to uh, your work and to take it forward so that that can be passed on to others in the future. Okay, so you could say that these are the four main elements uh, and this one here is possibly the one that really focuses on the advantages of, of publishing, especially within peer-reviewed papers. Okay, so why is it that we publish? What is the motivation behind a PhD student actually publishing? Okay, so we asked here, so an important skill with inside research is to be able to criticise not only your own work, but of the work of others. So we asked in an academic context, what type of person are you? Uh, are you critical of yourself, and not critical of others, and so on? So we can see here that uh, there is a good amount of support uh, behind this one, which is critical of yourself and also critical of others. So it's important that this is constructive criticism where we can identify the strengths and also the weaknesses of our own and others, the work of others. So why do you, would you want to publish? Does it make you a better researcher? And we can see here there is fairly strong agreement that it does actually make you a better researcher by publishing. Some are in the neutral and some are in the disagree here, but the vast majority identify that publishing work makes them a better researcher. In terms of informing your research community, we can see there is a very strong agreement with this one, uh, with the majority strongly agreeing. So an important part of publishing is informing your uh, research community of, of your work. Now we asked, does it improve the chances of getting a PhD? And we see again, very, very strong opinion here uh, in favour of that uh, for agreement that it does increase your chance, improve the chances of getting a PhD. Then we asked uh, about networking with, with others. Again, we can see a strong agreement here. And now we want, do we want peer review of our work? And we see a very strong opinion here towards this, 62%. And then to enhance their future research career, a very, very strong opinion here, 67% strongly agreed that they will, it will enhance the research, future research career. Then, does it allow me to, to be an expert in the domain? Bit of a, uh, an opinion here, but obviously a strong focus on uh, yes, for it to be seen with inside the, as an expert with inside the domain. What about in, enhancing the school, research group and university's reputation? Again, a bit of a split here, but a fairly good uh, agreement to this. Okay, so some of the things that uh, that it will it certainly helps with is to get a PhD, improves career opportunities, helps me network with others in the field, gets peer review for the work, helps me to become a better researcher, it helps to inform my research community, gives me credibility, and maybe someday to become an expert in my field. And it also enhances the reputation of the school, university, research group, and so on. And what's the reasons that you wouldn't publish at this time? Well, the majority are really split uh, between uh, that they don't have any results at the present time and that they don't know where to begin with uh, publishing. Okay, so what's the process that we go through uh, when we submit papers for peer review? So normally there's a there's a lead author for the publication. It's really for them to decide on the dissemination out, outlet. 
the aim, scope of the paper, and so on. Along with this, there is a very important publication team, and it's important that the lead author keeps these people up to date and for these people to give feedback to the lead author throughout the process. So normally what happens is that after reading the scope of the publication and how it would fit with the uh, general aim of the paper, there's a first draft of which the publication team should really input into and give their comments, after which there is a final revision and then uh, any updates are defined at that point. And the paper is then submitted to an editor or a chair of the conference and they will typically pick three reviewers. For journal publications it is often the case that the lead author is asked to name two or three possible reviewers and then it is up to the editor to actually choose the balance between uh, the unknown reviewers and the ones that have been selected by the lead author. It is thus important that the lead author possibly has a list of names of people that they would trust to review their paper. Often this is likely to include someone who is possibly referenced in the paper as a subject expert. After this, the reviewers will feed back their comments to the editor and then there is some decision fed back to the lead author. Uh, if it's an acceptance, then the, any revisions are done and the final paper is submitted. The actual review process uh, and the criteria depends on the, the journal or the conference, but these are some of the areas that they will typically look for relevance, originality, significance, content, soundness and clarity. The reviewers will then score each of these areas from 1 to 5 and generate a general score. In some conferences the score is then aggregated together and then a league table is produced and the bar is defined uh, at a certain point for the accepted papers and f for the rejected ones. Often though, for a journal publication, it is important that there is a reasonable score within inside each of these areas to define uh, a well-balanced paper. A key factor is relevance, so it is important for the, uh, the, the publication team to make sure that there is well defined in the paper, the relevance to the conference or the journal? Is it important for the audience that is receiving the, the paper? And especially could it stimulate some new discussion? So if it's a generally a new topic and a new area, then it will, this will be highly uh, graded. But it's important that it is focused, everything's focused, the terminology, the use of terms and so on is really matches with all the, the key uh, terms that are used with inside that that domain and that publication. Originality, uh, is it novel and innovative? Uh, new methods and applications are always good in here. Uh, has it been published anywhere else? And often an empirical case study with some data to show advantages with a new application domain is actually very good. Uh, we'll score very highly in this area. Significance uh, really looks at the basic contribution to the general theory practice within inside the field. And uh, when significance uh, publication, which is highly significant, will oft you'll often see many following papers and new direction, research directions following from it. But it's important to differentiate that something that uh, has significance, significance doesn't often have to be original. Often it's really a, a review that's defining new areas and a review process that's defining new areas and so on. Then we have the general content of the, the paper. Is it a good mechanism for really conveying the information with it? An important area is could non-experts in the domain actually understand it? 
and is there a good balance between the context, the literature, methods used and the results and that it isn't too overwhelmed in each of these areas, a nice balance overall. Then how sound is the methodology with inside the paper, what's the technical quality, uh, is it, are the results presented correctly and, and so on. Is, it, is, the, is the experimental procedure repeatable? And then finally, uh, there is clarity. Is it a well-organized paper? Does it have a clear presentation? Is it the right style, good standard of English, easy to read, good grammar, good use of diagrams, appropriate tables, references, and overall, it's a good length. It's not too short and it's not too, too long. Okay, so generally these are the criteria that a reviewer would use. Uh, and it is important to be able to score highly in each of the areas uh, to be able to, to get a good score. You can see that having a well-organized paper with good content, you can score highly in content and clarity. And then if we make sure that the relevance is fairly good, then the areas that we're really up against it are with inside the originality, the significance and the soundness. So it's important once we get past those first three, that we can then move on to the other three and score highly. It would be a shame to be let down on relevance, content and clarity when there is significant originality and significance but it just isn't presented correctly. So the paper is then submitted into the editor or the chair who will then pass it on to the relevant uh, person uh, with inside that, that subject area. They will then select the three reviewers for the paper and then there is a final decision. Uh, some time limit is given for each of these reviewers and there is often a time out uh, where the reviewers fail to submit the paper, the, the review back. So the reviewer can decide whether the two, one or two reviews is enough or to elect a new one. But from them we will see uh, a number of decisions strong accept, accept, weak accept, neutral, weak reject, reject and strong reject. The higher, if we can get it into the accept region then we know that the paper will be published and it's just a matter of addressing some of the revisions. If it's in the lower half then it may be that the paper will eventually be rejected. But there's, there could be a, a voting process with inside the publication and the two positives against one negative might win. Two negatives against one positive is unlikely to win, but some journals require three positives, three acceptances to be able to take the publication forward. The editor needs to know how strong the reviewer is in the area so that they can balance up the comments. So someone might reject a paper but not be very strong in the area. Someone might give it a strong acceptance but uh, is actually fairly weak. So it is up to the reviewer to be able to define if they're strong, they have some expertise, or if they're weak in the area. Then they feed comments back. One is kept private and goes to the chair. And this is often a justification of why the paper has been accepted or rejected, giving the strengths and weaknesses of the paper. The other one goes back to the authors to provide them with some constructive feedback. And the key thing with that is how to highlight any improvements to the uh, paper, identify spelling mistakes, and so on, and to possibly say where the publication, where it could be, the paper could be published, or to give them some idea of how they could improve the paper to be able to push it up and to be acceptable. Okay, so where would we see the weaknesses in the methodology? That would come through on the soundness of the paper. Where would we comment on a badly written paper? Well, that would be the clarity. Where would we focus our comments on the novelty of the paper? Well, that would be on the originality in which we would focus our comments if the paper fits into a conference. Obviously that's the relevance. The result of a weak acceptance. 
that's my revisions and resubmit. It's often important to really mitigate against the update with the revisions fairly quickly uh, so that there is not a timeout on the actual changes to be made. Strong reject leads to an unconditional rejection. So, why do papers get rejected? What are some common things that a reviewer might find fairly easy to reject a paper uh, before the, the basic substance of the paper is even looked at? So some typical comments that, that come back is the paper doesn't have focus. So it's important, as we'll see, that the, the, the paper reinforces the focus throughout and each of the sections at the start and then especially at the end to really show where it is going and what it intends to do and sticks to that. The paper could have ethical issues, which is obviously a, a problem area. It might include things that might give away identities of individuals and so on. The paper does not fit into the scope of the publication of the conference is one that can often be applied. It's obviously the wrong place for to disseminate this information. And it will be fairly easy for a reviewer to dismiss a paper because it just doesn't fit. The paper is full of typos with poor use of grammar. Uh, can often identify weaknesses in the research infrastructure, lack of checking, lack of rigour in, uh, in the actual methodology and the results. Uh, an annoyance for, for many uh, reviewers is that the paper is overly long and has got too much superficial information. This again can highlight a weak research infrastructure where there is a lack of review with inside the, the, the processes. Papers badly structured is is, uh, is another problem, uh, in that things aren't presented right in the right areas. Paper does not contribute to anything to the current practice. Uh, really, there should be some novelty in some way of the of the information, and some new proposed methods, techniques, and and so on. Paper defines work in progress uh, can be a problem when submitting to journals. Sometimes uh, when submitting to conferences it's quite good to define a work in progress uh, because it's known that possibly the, the complete work will be presented at the conference itself uh, but this can be a, a typical comment when there is new, no new findings with inside the paper. Another weakness can be that there is no significant underpinning of the word current is, is important here so we can fill it full of literature but if it's not up to date, if it doesn't have the literature which is up, up to the minute, then that could be seen as a, pot a potential weakness. So too often papers are submitted with old literature reviews which do not touch base with the current practice. And this leads on to the paper is significantly out of date of the literature and it lacks any sort of scope. There hasn't been a wide enough net cast around the literature to properly define the field and the current practice. Then to dive in more deep, deeply, uh, the paper says it's original uh, but the technique has been used before. So the word new and novel can be overplayed. If, if you played that card then you're defining that it's original. If someone else had already done it in this sort of way, then the paper can be rejected for that reason. Experimental methodology is not defined, and then the results cannot be verified. So this is highly important in research. So all over a, a, the, the techniques and experiments within a paper should be repeatable by anyone, not just the research team who created it. So it is important that we actually define the, all the techniques used so that someone else can re repeat this experiment. It could be defined in an appendix or it could be on an associated website, but there is some way that somebody can actually find out how to actually repeat the experiments. No novelty defined uh, and the abstracts and conclusions do not collectively represent the work. It is often the case that abstracts and conclusions are very 
poorly written uh, and can be easily, the whole paper can be rejected on the, on the basis of that. The application into the current practice is difficult to see, so we, we might come up with a great new method or technique, but it is very difficult to see how it could really be applied into a real life system. So it's often important to actually define where there are barriers to entry of, of a, a technique uh, and how it could be applied into current practice. It doesn't have to be in the whole current practice, it's likely to be within a certain niche. We can also say that it's naive in the coverage of the area with no references to leading publications. This is uh, often a case that there is one uh, subliminal paper that needs to be referred to again and again and the researchers have completely missed off uh, that reference. So it's uh, important that PhD students keep up to date with the work and know the key publications at any given time. The results show very little significance and this is a key word. So we can present results and we can say that something is greater or less or, or and so on but whether it really is significance, significant is key. Something that could change by 0 0.001 might show an increase but really is that a significant factor. So we need to differentiate uh, superficial enhancements uh, and real significance within the paper. It does no harm to actually say that the results are not significant uh, but it is important that we don't try and highlight something and overplay it within our results. Okay so let's look at how we structure our papers. So it obviously depends on the publication and the domain and so on but there's a fairly standard approach to how you structure a research and academic paper. So one of the first things that is, is important, and we'll highlight the colours uh, defining how important it is to, for the reviewer and to make sure that it's right. So this is a highly important area. And we, for the title, we obviously just have one sentence to really define our uh, title of our paper. And, but it's important that we use significant words for our research so that they're relevant to the conference. And it's important for the reviewers to be able to pick up the areas to show this relevance. Also, the words that we use in the title will be words that uh, will stick for the rest of our research career. So we need to make sure that it's significant and we're proud of the, our publications because it's often the only thing that someone will see is the names of our papers. So good words to use uh, that are strong and research focused are novel, frameworks, simulation, evaluation, improvements, analysis, architecture, models and so on. Some weaker words are implementation, requirements, test, plan, build, outline, measure, benefits, validation and so on. Uh, not quite as forceful as some of these words here and less, more focused on development but these are more focused on research type objectives. And so we can see here, it's the same, same paper, but with a, a different title. One is very much focused on showing that it's a novel method, it's evaluating something, it defines the application domain, uh, it shows what we're trying to achieve, and gives a hint towards the technical systems that we're actually evaluating against. But this one over here is fairly bland and passive implementation of a test plan for measuring delay and accessing records is the same thing, uh, but you can see that this one probably has a very high, higher chance to, to actually uh, define the, the correct research area and show relevance straight, straight away in the paper. So after the title becomes uh, one of the areas or one of the sections which is often not done that well but is significant to the whole paper. With the abstract we have one or two paragraphs to really distill the whole of the paper into this short space. So really it's trying to summarise the whole paper in a very short space and it takes great skill to be able to do this without really making it feel like an introduction to the work. So we define the context, why it exists, what the issues are just now and what our research is trying to achieve and, and improve, what the main aim of the paper, remember it's the paper that we're trying to outline the aim and not of the research work in general. 
we're defining the tools, designs, methodologies that we've used so that someone can see in the abstract what methods, what tools we've used and what the significant results are, what the basic contribution uh, is that we are providing and any pointers to future work. So we can see here for the context of the work and we'll just change the colour of the pen. So for the context of the work we can see here that this is so important uh, and we've actually given it a whole paragraph. This defines what the problem is, what the general issues are, uh, what is holding back things uh, and, and really defines the background to the motivation behind our work. Then we have the aim, so we state the aim of the paper very crisply. No need for objectives in, in this part. We just define just one aim for the overall paper and our paper should achieve that, that one aim. Then we're going to define the basic design methodology tools that we're actually using. So we can see here we've designed, we've told the, the reviewer exactly what it is that we're actually going to build and implement and what, what the tools are we're, that we're actually using. Then we define any significant results. So we can see this section here is actually showing us some sort of significance with inside the abstract of what we've managed to achieve. Then uh, it defines what, how we're using this to uh, contribute to general practice, current practice. Okay, so we can see here this is what we're trying to deliver. Then what, what we're outlining is is pointers to future work. So we're saying here that it's quite good for some things, but unfortunately it's not so good uh, in other things. So we're defining where the future work is likely to be, all in an abstract. This one, the one section really defines and can can be the reason that a paper is accepted or not. If we can get it right here, then the reviewer feels much more comfortable in what is presented later on and understands the whole context of it. Okay, so it's highly significant and we need to make sure that uh, uh, we get this right. It's the first thing that anyone will read and it's the first thing that uh, the perceptions of the paper and, and the writers are done here. Then we have the introduction and this gives us an opportunity to expand some of the things that we outlined in the abstract to give a fuller context of the work, to maybe try and engage uh, our audience, especially the reviewer at this stage, to find the aim of the paper and any objectives that we have for it, give an overview of the paper's contribution with inside the introduction. So just tell the reader exactly what's going to be delivered in here and hopefully they will feel comfortable to, to really move on and read the rest of the paper. And we can outline the basic paper structure. Section 2 has this, Section 3 has that, and so on. So we can see here we've tried to engage the reader by some current work, defining some of the issues within the field and, and really try to make it as engaging as possible. We might also have some underpinning research that uh, is things that might have been said in the media and targets for governments and so on to really put it into a societal, to show the societal benefits of our work. But generally just trying to enthuse uh, the non-specialist with inside here. Overall, the introduction should be able to be read by a 12 year old uh, who can really understand why the paper exists and, and uh, there should be nothing here that, that, that provides jargon and, and so on. So we can see here we're starting to hint towards the aim of the, the paper and what it builds on and, and so on. So this is our first opportunity to really start the narrative going. It's about one half a page or, or one page uh, maximum. We might have a background section after this, but let's just straight run, go straight into the literature view. Typically two or three pages of a seven page paper. Uh, provides a basic introduction, so it's important that we reinforce the main aim of what we're trying to do again, and then we give the main aim of what we're trying to do with inside the literature review and what are the techniques that we're actually going to cover. 
So then we'll split them up and then we'll actually try and show the underpinning literature in our area, trying to keep as up to date as possible with current methods. And there's a real art to, to writing this and you should really focus on previous and current methods with inside the field, especially looking at the ones that are underpinning your work so that the reader can understand what's coming up next and what the main research is in the area. So I've highlighted this as a, as a yellow or amber area, not quite as important as the abstract or the possibly the introduction, but a key part and some of it is mechanistic, we were really just touching base and it possibly won't be read in as much detail as some of the earlier sections uh, but it's certainly an important part. If we can set up with a reader that looks as if we know our area and we know the key literature, then they will probably feel comfortable that they don't have to read it in any great depth. Next, we might have a design methodology uh, model section, two to three pages, say. We have, again, an introduction that possibly binds what we said in the in the literature review, bring it forward, uh, and bind on to this section here. Again, we reinforce any new literature. It's important that we keep referring to literature throughout the paper. So many papers suffer from only having uh, references with inside the literature review and they kind of forget about them. So it's important that we keep touching base with papers, even though we might be stating them again. Uh, we're actually trying to pull out the ones that were taken from the previous literature review section into the into this one but it makes the the section stand alone if, if possible uh, so in here we define the basic methodology of the design the model that we're creating and as much as possible we define it in a fairly scientific approach uh, if there's previous methods then we show how we build on them if there are our own papers then we refer to previous work uh, so that the, the reader can actually read how we've actually built on them if they want to go and check. Some reviewers will actually check the previous methods. Okay, so in this section, if possible, use diagrams to really illustrate some of the techniques that, that, that you can have. As much as possible, we want to draw pictures to actually illustrate our basic uh, story for our, our, our page so that if someone was to skim read, they will still be able to understand what we're actually trying to do. Okay, but this one, this section is very much a strong scientific, has a strong scientific background. Then a highly important uh, section is then the results or evaluation section, two to three pages. This could be work in progress with inside a conference type paper, or is likely to be more formal presentation of some results uh, in, a, in a journal paper. But it generally has a hypothesis of what our evaluation and our experiments are trying to achieve. What's the standpoint for them? What was their basic motivation? Then we'll provide a summary of the results, not just repeated graphs or, or tables, but possibly some compilation within a one chart or two or within a single table. A key part of this is that the results need to be defined with their significance. So if something is 0.0001% uh, percent better, does that mean that the results are actually significant? Just because something increases or decreases doesn't mean that there's actually a significant factor involved. So it's often important to define percentages to show uh, basic significance and not just to provide the numbers as they are. As they are. Okay, so in a high-impact journal, we would typically take one or two other competing techniques that are state-of-the-art methods and show how our our method improves or not the, the existing ones. And it's important to remember that validation isn't evaluation. Validation just proves that something uh, can be done or is doing it where evaluation actually starts to stress and uh, around the, the key areas of the evaluation. Okay, so again we can see here that we're, we define an introduction again uh, and we touch base with some papers and so on uh, and we'll actually see what were the basic methodology that we're actually using and then we just really do, do try and explain our results as much as possible. 
it is so important that we compile results into a single table, single chart, or so on, uh, and and to try and minimise the the amount of data that's that's uh, presented in in different ways here. And then in the final part, again, this is red. This is highly important uh, section, and it's in here. We might have half a page within a seven-page paper. And we discuss the main findings, highlighting any key literature that we that we that we said, especially ones that we're repeating again and again throughout the 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 paper should be brought up here. Uh, all the methods that we presented and any again we use the word significant results that we've actually found. Then we can lead on to any future work to give uh, pointers to where it could be extended or in future research directions. So here we go again, we reinforce the aim of what we're trying to do. Again, it's in there, and then we straight up front give them uh, the basic results that we've actually shown. Then we might have our contribution, what is it we've actually added with this paper, and we need to be critical of our own work uh, and to see what's not so good in the system. It's this not so good that can then lead us to, to point towards uh, the future work uh, and define where we can move forward, where we're moving forward or where the field should move forward. Again, this all should really tie into the abstract. So just check in your abstract that you've actually said all these things. In fact, write this and then go back to your abstract and pull out these factors in here so that your conclusions actually match with what you've actually said in your abstract and then your introduction. Okay, one of the weakest areas is often uh, the lack of proofreading within inside a research paper. This can often show a, a lack of uh, strong reviewing, uh, a weak research environment and so on. So it's important that, that, uh, that a paper is proofread uh, before it is submitted. Okay, so let's have a quick look at uh, for this audience what uh, system they actually use, just Word on its own, Word with EndNote, LaTeX, or another package. So you can see in this case that the majority was uh, was Word, but there are quite a few that are using LaTeX uh, for uh, writing research papers. So two, for any document of scale, it's important that uh, we use something that can integrate our references and bibliography so that we can build up a body of knowledge. So it's really Word with EndNote and LaTeX that would give us this type of environment. LaTeX is often the submission mechanism uh, of choice for, for many journals uh, and quite a few conferences. And it gives us many advantages uh, that uh, that we can have, and that we can lay out our, our paper in a, in a text format with our our citations embedded, along with uh, a bibliography that will actually pull these together. So it's fairly easy for us to go from a Harvard APA type format into an IEEE uh, format without actually changing the the actual paper with within it. Uh, another good advantage is that uh, we can actually define the basic style of the paper. In this case, it's just a standard A4 type paper that, that we have. So let's see, we would often compile this. And so let's try and find that paper. So let's create our PDF from here. Oh, we can't open it because we've already got it open here. So we can see here that uh, this is the type of output that it creates. So it will generally take the style uh, for the paper and can actually apply it 
uh, to give the actual right format for the publication that, that we're actually writing for. Uh, so we can see another another example of that here. Okay, so we can see that uh, the actual tech file will actually define the, the basic layout of our paper. So if we want to change it from one star to the next, it's often just a single change. So it's important that, uh, that researchers have a look at each of the systems and, and define whichever is, is best uh, for them. But many Publishers still use LaTeX and it is a very powerful uh, system for actually uh, creating the research presentations. The great advantage is it really decouples the actual layout from the actual content of the system and then gets it ready for a PDF type, type format. Okay, so when, when we're referencing, do we put the references at the end of a paragraph to the related work? Do we put the reference uh, in the relevant part of the sentence, or do we actually name the authors directly in the text with the reference? So we can see here very strong consent around actually placing the reference to the to the to the paper directly into the actual text. Okay, so uh, so some of the things uh, that typos cause uh, with inside a research paper for a reviewer becomes annoying for the reviewer, shows poor supervision, team working, shows a lack of attention to detail, poor for a researcher really, shows that the paper might have been rushed a little bit, too many typos, is the researcher really motivated to submit to this paper or this publication or conference? when they can't really check their own work, could identify that there's actually weak research foundations to the work, poor standards and actually uh, setting, uh, poor standards to set the inter for an international standing paper, and also the typos could cause the misrepresentation uh, of the work. We can see there the word not has been left out, which uh, could be construed incorrectly in this case, while the results are significant, it can be seen that there is a slight improvement in performance. Obviously, the not should have been inserted into this text, otherwise it is wrong. Okay, so it's very difficult to actually sit down and, and uh, it's a difficult process to sit down and, and review the whole of a paper, but it's very important that the paper is printed out and the researcher sits down for a single session and tries to read over the whole paper with a red, a green pen to actually mark up the 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 typos. Okay, so let's have a look at this example. So can we spot first line in a matter of the of a few decades the world has changed from an industrial age into information age? Your eye will often just look at that and not actually realize that there is a word missing out and we'll often put in the word an. So we mark up on our sheet. Often no need to do double spacing. We can do it like this. Side in the margins we can say insert an information age. It is one which, unlike other ages, encapsulates, encapsulates virtually the whole world. And we go on, which allow, so again, we want an S to be inserted in there, and so on. So we can go through, and here we are. There's a problem here that should be requiring. There's a full stop missing here. This should be a capital F because we're referring to a real object, which is a figure. So uh, all uh, real things should have a capital F there. So that should be a capital F. Businesses is wrong. Here. 
largely replaced. Here is a problem. And we'd highlight this in green. We'd, we'd put some sort of highlight in green pen and say this doesn't some something quite wrong here. We've said around for hundreds, if not hundreds of years, looks like that should be thousands. Tried and tested is got hyphens in it. Try to do your hyphens as much as possible. Uh, well known and then recounted. On the other hand, off and require a simple form such as a printed piece of paper and the other person of the other person that shouldn't be there and then of an inkjet printer and there should be a hyphen in there okay so it's important that we sit down and really mark up we read over again and again to make sure that it's it's been well read so this was an example of the markup that we get there's the, the, the green pen and so on and the markup in the margins uh, that we can see here but there's no guarantee that we've actually went through and and captured every single one of them but at least certainly around the start of the document the introduction make sure it's fairly bulletproof and there is no typos in here later on we may get okay the the actual readability of the paper and how it's presented is very, very important uh, to allow for the, the reviewer to easily read the paper, understand it without actually going back and forward uh, all the time. So it's important that we use the standard templates that uh, are defined for our conference or for our journal and to fit in with these make sure that the the presentation length of the number of pages does not exceed uh, the ones actually defined and that the paper itself is quite concise in its presentation without any superficial information it takes a good researcher eye to be able to identify something that doesn't quite fit and should be taken out in that way you're actually reducing the time and the workload of the reviewer and making it easier for them you got to mind that uh, researchers are often doing this without pay, often in the evenings and weekends and, and so on. So they, they have a limited amount of time. They're obviously, typically also, uh, highly, uh, high, high, they have high workloads too. So they're trying to be very efficient in what they're doing and can spot when something it doesn't quite fit for them. Okay, so we'll look at an example paper and uh, we'll see what it actually looks like okay so here's one here that's an IEEE type paper looks looks nice uh, using the standard uh, old-fashioned IEEE format of Times Room New Roman uh, if possible always try to use a serif font such as Times New Roman for the text titles themselves can be a sans serif such as Arial or so on but you can see here that it looks very good to use uh, a more traditional type font, Times New Roman, uh, and so on, for our uh, main text. So we can tell it's uh, a serif font because it has little tails that, that aid the reading of the paper. Okay, so this follows roughly what we said. There's the abstract, the introduction, some sort of overview. Uh, and we can see there there are diagrams within it and and so on uh, the methodology to find and there is some results at the end and the references are defined in the IEEE type format okay so let's look at the basic paper so you see the papers use bullet points here to define the objectives uh, with inside with the project this this relates to bullet points are quite good don't overdo them keep them quite succinct uh, but they're a quite good way to drag to split the text up and also to show some key principles 
is fairly well laid out with a standard template. Good well focused aim with inside here and with inside the introduction. Well paced section. So this section here you can see isn't isn't too long. Uh, there is our, our introduction to the rest of the paper here. We have the aim here and uh, and, and so on. Well focused abstract really defines what it's actually going to deliver. There you go, there's some results there and then there is the possible future work. Key index terms will allow the the, the chair uh, or the editor to be able to find the right person for the for the review process. Here we see that uh, diagrams have been used to illustrate the, the main design uh, used with inside uh, the, the system. There's an introduction to each section uh, of it that really reinforcing the objectives again and again uh, with inside to them. Uh, split some complex things down into, s we wouldn't put a subheading below that because it starts to become uh, uh, the numbers start to increase all the time. So we have sub subsections which are actually starting to split up our design here into into smaller elements to make them more understandable. Diagrams uh, should be referred to with a figure number. Okay, so we should be able to find a figure number hopefully before this diagram and it should refer to that. Try not to split the flow of the text by having a diagram. Put the diagram on another page or somewhere where we can naturally split the sections. Try to always keep the narrative flowing all the time to give the opportunity for the person to read and then make reference to the diagram as required. Okay, all diagrams should have the figure number defined within inside them. And if you can, try to put the diagrams at the top and or at the bottom of, of a page. That allows a large area of text to be, to be defined in between. Tables are used in this case to show the main design elements. It would be difficult to really show this type of thing with inside some text, so it's good use of tables here. The equipment used with inside the experiments is, is defined within a table here. Uh, the graph should be reproducible in black and white because often the printout will be in black and white, and certainly most journals and conference proceedings are printed in black and white. So we use dashed lines instead of actual colours. It does no harm to put colours as long as we use dashed lines uh, for them. In this case we have dotted lines, full lines and dashed lines. Strong statement on the significance of the work uh, with inside here. And the conclusions reinforce the main aim. Again, it's recapping exactly what we did uh, before. Okay, good use of references here, quite far ranging, some older ones, newer ones, uh, and so on, uh, fairly well encapsulated. Future work here actually shows where it should be going for future work. Here we go, there it's there. Acknowledgements are quite good to show which other projects that, uh, that indicates with this, maybe to show the scope of the research and only just one or two references to the work of the, the researchers. A reviewer will often spot when somebody is trying to increase their, their Google citation uh, index. Some of the key things that, that should be avoided uh, within a paper is not to make it too bland and passive. So if possible, do not write in a passive voice. With a passive voice, uh, we use things like was conducted as, as a passive term. So you can see that Word has actually picked this up, green lined it uh, for that, and it makes for a very boring read. So the the uh, an example of a passive term is that the nail was hit on the head by the hammer. So it's only until you get to the end of the sentence that you know what the main focus of the sentence or the main item of the sentence actually was. Much better to say that the hammer hit the nail. So we can always change our passive voice into an active one and we can see here we get rid of the was conducted uh, and make it much more 
focused experiment uses a network analyzer and a latency meter measured the the delay so word itself if you're using word uh, has a very good style and grammar checker but it's important to turn this on and it will check a whole lot of things so let's see if we can find word okay so there we go there's our highlight and if we just find the grammar checker the style checker it will check for a whole lot of things within our system so just make sure that that's actually on and then we can check for a whole lot of things uh, such as for uh, styles here gender specific words uh, passive sentences there we go sentence structure use of first person that we'll see in a little minute wordiness uh, and so on so make sure that these are actually switched on and then when it highlights something then you can actually go and get some idea about what the grammar element actually is so you hopefully learn how to improve your grammar and, and style okay so this shows shows it here very very important tool and you'll learn a lot about uh, grammar and style from this magical little help item another key thing is is uh, often when we use the term I and we it shows a little bit naivety and actually writing uh, I sounds like the kind of things we would say at school and we uh, we've got to try and understand who we actually are so it can be very confusing when you're reviewing a paper so avoid first person I first person plural and second person you because we don't know who you actually is so always we use third person if it's a thesis we say this thesis if it's a paper we say this p paper and we always refer to it that because the the paper is the entity is the thing that's really communicating so we divorce ourselves as people from from this dissemination item and it becomes the paper that's actually saying these things and has the focus watch for genders uh, obviously we've got to avoid things like he and she and so on so we just make sure that we can talk about the user uh, and so on we can always rephrase a sentence to get rid of these gender items another thing we need to avoid is stilted text it makes it quite difficult to actually read as a reviewer if paragraphs just have one or two sentences then we read the paragraph we stop we try and think about it we then go into the next one we stop thinking about it and so on so it becomes quite stilted through the argument it's never really getting going at all so make sure that you you, you wrap up your paragraphs and then to find breathing spaces uh, for thinking and to, to move on between paragraphs so the flow of paragraphs is actually quite important just avoid these stilted uh, narratives that we see on the left hand side here but avoid long ones too because you really need to give the reviewer and the reader some sort of break every now and then to make them stop so a paragraph is a natural place that someone would would read to and then stop take some breath try and understand what was said if they don't understand they'll read the paragraph again and so on but if they're quite happy they will move on and so on and this one here we can see wherever stopping and starting never quite binding narratives together we need to make sure that diagrams charts and tables are well presented this one might have problems and that when we print it in black and white it might not display very well so we make sure the chart really represents the information that we're actually trying to uh, show results should also show uh, significant figures we can see a problem in this one here it's very difficult to determine what the percentage increase and whether there's a large increase or a low increase at all so we would typically put uh, say percentages let's say that that's plus 20 percent and that's plus five percent and so on so beside our figures we might actually put the actual significance so that somebody can actually see the difference between our figures and so on and we can refer to these percentages which are much more significant than actually having to look at the numbers 
we might also be showing naivety in the number of decimal places that we're actually showing. So we would cut these down because they're probably not significant, uh, especially in relation to the actual error rate of our, our measurements. Okay, we're nearly there and we'll look at the final sections of how to review a paper. So if you're lucky enough to be able to be a reviewer, uh, then it's, it's a good experience to understand how papers are actually reviewed. So there are various levels to how we, we need to uh, review things. Uh, so it is important that you understand the basic criterion for this because you've got to be fair and honest to every paper that you actually review. So it really it all revolves around the key areas that we're trying to actually define relevance, originality, significance, content, soundness and clarity. So these are all basic measurements that we would have on a table. So obviously in some publications we might not need some of these things or we might actually add new ones. But certainly relevance is a, is a key one. Uh, significance might be important to the content and clarity are, are important for possibly first level uh, publications, but again, what we what we basically do is to is to look at each of the sections and possibly try to measure whether uh, each part is covered. For these core things, are abstract, is succinct, and to the point, and actually tells us about the whole paper. Our introduction gives us some context to the work and the overall aim of what it's trying to do and the structure. Our lit review at least touches based with some of the previous and current work in the area. Uh, our methodology at least defines that there is some scientific methodology behind what is, is presented. The results actually show something in, in some significant or non-significant way uh, and is highlighted uh, for both counts. And our conclusions actually do sum up the main findings of the paper and with a hint towards future work. If the paper can address each of these areas, then it's a long way along the track of being able to help with these assessments. Okay. So some other trip tips on improving success. Well, there's almost an endless number, uh, but uh, you need to possibly include your supervisors with inside the author's team by default. If they don't want to be in the paper, you can take the names off. Try, if possible, to tell the whole story of the paper through your pictures and your charts and so on, because some people will skim read your paper. Always try to make the evaluation the focal point of your paper in the end. That's the end point, really, of what you're trying to show, uh, and then it's reinforced with inside the conclusions. You should aim the quality, uh, aim your paper at the quality of the, the publication. Make sure that everybody agrees to the submission and that all the ethics have been uh, uh, approved before you go forward. Read the guidelines before you submit and use all the templates. Look for weaknesses in your own work and, and then try and highlight them and continually read over it again and again. Make sure you, re you write precisely. Use the rest of the team to be able to get some review and continually update again and again to really improve the quality of your work. Good thing to do is to get a non-expert, somebody that you know quite well, who will be fairly honest with you and they can actually read especially the starting part of your paper. See if they find it interesting. If they don't, why don't they find it interesting? What's the general problems? Does it read well? Is it too much jargon? And so on. And that brings us on to avoiding jargon and acronyms and so on. Okay, so we've covered uh, some of the key things around writing, reviewing, and appraising research publications, why you should publish, many reasons. One of the strongest is to actually get your PhD and get some peer review. We went through the peer review process and how important it was to understand that and the feedback that are, that happens and some of the criterion that your paper is assessed against. Some of the common things that might get a paper rejected, lots of typos, bad structure, lack of narrative, weak conclusions, poor abstract and so on. We looked at the basic paper structure, abstract introduction, literature review, methodology, uh, results, conclusions, future work and so on. 
then we show the importance of proofreading uh, of your work and in improving the readability and presentation of your papers. Then, if you're lucky enough, how you would might review based on the criterion that we've seen above and then a few other tips. Okay, thank you.